Cool. Um, well, as an introduction, since it's now being recorded, I should probably get formal head on a little bit. Happy kids. Um, we've asked, been asked to live stream this evening for the purposes of some people that might not be here and a few people further afield. Um, so we're going to give that a go. Hopefully they can hear us. Because of the way keynote works, I can't actually tell if people are complaining. So, <laughs> hey! <laughs> uh, <laughs> who knows? Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, so hopefully it'll work out all right. I hadn't really planned much of a talk until this afternoon at lunchtime. So, we'll, yeah, again, see how it goes. It should be wonderful. Um, Have got a link for this? There is a link on Twitter. Um, if someone else could share that because I can't can I watch it? Be, oh yeah you can watch it on your phone in the same room that would be really good um yeah so the talk today is going to be on PHP 7 coming soon um the kind of what why how when and who um of PHP 7 because this is now being streamed I thought it was best to put in a sponsor slide so yeah and um, we host the meetups every month first Wednesday of every month if anyone wants to come who's not here it's weird talking to people who can find yeah um Fifth Ring sponsors the venue that give us a place to meet, so it's wonderful for them. And JetBrains give us a PHP Storm license, well, not just PHP Storm, but an IDE license every month um, to raffle off, so that's good. We're still looking for someone to pay for a pizza and drink, so if you feel swayed to do so, there's a PayPal account where you can just drop any amount of money. Um, if you do it under 2p, that's going to be a real pain in the ass because they charge you 3p to actually make a transaction, so don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anything above 3p is fine. Um, um, if you're looking for a kind of more long-term sponsorship plan or something, get in touch and we can sort something out. Um, um, it's been told that all good speakers start with a quote, so I've used always start with a quote that will do um, uh, that's fine and continue um, first of all going to go through what is PHP 7 why you should care um, basically it's the first major release of PHP since 2004 so it's been a long time coming um, and hopefully you will see that there are some benefits to it um, even if it has taken them you know significantly longer than it might have to, to get it all out the door. Um, so we're going to take a quick look through some of the new features and a few things that have changed, have been deprecated, have been taken out, um, and a few things that might cause some problems with upgrading. Um, first of all, some new stuff. We have a new operator. Um, oh god, I hear my voice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, we have the new operator, the combined comparison operator, or the spaceship operator, which is a combination of less than, equals, and greater than, all in one operator, which is wonderfully easy to remember because that's the symbols they use for the comparison, so that's, that's wonderful. Basically, the way that this works is if you've got two things that are equal, it's going to return a zero, so you know that they're equal. That's lovely. If the left-hand side is greater than the right-hand side, it returns a one, so you know it's greater than. And if the left-hand side is less than the right-hand side, it returns a negative one. So it just means that rather than doing if it's greater than this, so if it's less than this, if it's what you just one operation that kind of manages all that for you. I'm not entirely sure that I've been convinced by any real use cases for this yet, but I'm sure things will crop up once people start getting more more familiar with it. That's not the only, um, sorry, the, uh, this can be used with numbers, it can also be used with strings and arrays, but it can't be used on objects, so just don't try that, it breaks, so don't, don't do it. Um, that's not the only other operator that's coming in PHP 7. We've got something called the null coalesce operator, which is two question marks. Um, this is pretty similar, if people are familiar with in PHP 5, there is ternary shorthand, which essentially is, in this situation, it'll be if A, echo A, else echo B. So that is the shorthand. That's available in PHP 5. That's, I can't remember, I think it's PHP 5.3 or 5.4 that had that, yeah. Um, but now we've got this option where, I'm just going to step through it step by step. So we've got a variable user group, which is called Aberdeen PHP. We then go echo pizza, question mark, question mark, user group. So what it does is it wraps that pizza in an is set and does exactly the same thing as the ternary one. But it means that the variable doesn't actually have to exist and it will still produce the right thing. So obviously there's no pizza. 
Um, so it outputs Aberdeen PHP. Unfortunately, there is actually still pizza, so that's, that's backfired a little. <laughs> I should put this slide later on. Um, the other advantage is that you can chain these together, so you can have pizza, beer, already finished. So if pizza's not set, it moves on to the next one, which is beer. If that's not set, it moves on to the next one. So in this case, it would print out already finished. But it is, it's just a kind of a shorthand way of doing what could essentially be quite a complicated if statement. It's quite handy for setting defaults and things like that, um, especially if you're not entirely sure that a variable will be set. Um, so that is a particularly useful one. Um, there are a lot of things that are coming in PHP 7 which are to do with types. So I've kind of grouped these all together. Um, and some of them I'm going over, they're quite big, so I'm just glossing a little, um, so bear with that one. Um, first one is there's now a type error, which in this situation we've got a really pointless function that just wraps count, um, and it accepts an array of attendees. So you get that, you put an array in, and it works fine, and it outputs the, the count of that array. If you put a string into it, you will now, in PHP 5, you would get a fatable, a catchable fatal error. Um, so you'd have to catch that error and it'd be a fatal error, but you wouldn't necessarily know exactly what it was without doing a bit of debugging. Um, in PHP 7, you get an uncaught type error. So that means that you can catch type errors specifically and you can handle that more appropriately than you would have if you just get fatal error and you freak out. Whereas um, this way, it'll tell you it's a type error. You know specifically something of the wrong type has been passed in and you can you know, handle that and die a little bit grace more gracefully. Um, Sorry, just think of uh, would we wrap that kind of stuff in a try catch? Yeah, you would wrap the yeah, when you're function deck no when you're calling the function you would wrap that in a try catch because then it would it would throw it from the function so wherever you're actually calling the function that's where you put the try catch. Yeah, so then, so you catch PHP errors. Yeah, I think it's catch exceptions. This is yeah. PHP <laughs> thing enough. Yeah, well, it basically exceptions and errors now are kind of they both inherit from throwable, uh -huh. so you can catch things better and um, this is one of the things that it's quite heavy going so I thought for the case of trying to keep this quite so succinct <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I would just put a link to this guy called Davy Shafik who has done a really good article on it and he goes through full details of everything about throwable um, and catching exceptions and errors and handling them properly and um, so that's a really good link it's at the end of the slides as well which I'll leave up for a while so people can have a look at and um, but yeah it's, it's much better than I could see in, in the time frame we've got. Um, so that's type errors. The next bit is we've got some type hints. Obviously PHP has had type hints for a while, so you can say this function accepts a class of type user, and then it requires that that function, when it's called, is given a user class. Um, they've added scalar type hints, so you can now say a function requires an integer, or a function requires a string, or a float, or a billion. And the way that this works by default is if where it says an integer max, this is again trivial, like totally trivial examples, but um, where it says an integer requires um, maximum, if you put a, a string of one, that will cast that to an integer and it'll handle it appropriately. However, if that is not the effect that you want, there is an option for strict type hints, which basically this it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, you put declare strict types equals one at the top of your page, um, and for that script, only in the, the kind of the lifespan of that file, anything that calls it adheres to strict type hits, so it won't do that kind of on the fly casting integers and, and stuff like that. So you get a little bit more consistency. It doesn't affect like libraries, so if you're using a library and they don't require that, it doesn't break things, so it makes it a little bit more controlled. Um, so there are a few other kind of edge casey stuff, but yeah, there's that's the the general gist so of it. So once you declare um, strict types, can you redo what? Can you escape that? Um, it's it's that? in the one file. There was a thing um, an RFC about kind of letting you parameter, well, not parameterize, but kind of have a start and stop of it. But as far as I'm aware, that's not been included um, in the the release. I think they decided that. Just doing it one file. I might be wrong on that one. Um, Does that but affect including files in the script? No, it's just mm -hmm. the script file itself. Script so if you include other things, it's just that file, uh, that like physical file. file. It's not. It's not things that are extended from it. It's not. Yeah. What about so, things that call it? Things that call it. It depends on whether they call the file or if it's a class in the file. Right. Like if it's a 
if it's a class in the fail and you call that, it won't have much of a take. But if it's a, if you're actually including that fail in something else for the lifetime of that fail, it will have strict typing on it. And um, so, so any functions that are called in that file will have the strict typing set on it. Okay. Um, more type stuff. Um, this one is, to be honest, one of my particularly one of my favourite features. I, I love this. It's awesome. Um, which is return type pins, which is a lot of other languages have them. Um, it's particularly good if you're doing um, interfaces and that kind of thing where you want to have kind of self-documented code. Whereas this function, which is exactly the same function as previously, but all we've done is added colon int after the parameters, and that just says that this function must return an integer. If it doesn't return an integer, it's going to fail. So it needs to return an integer, which means if you're doing an interface, you say return in or return, you can use a class name so you can say return user, it has to return a user, um, which gives you that little bit more kind of confidence that if you say, if you're doing something that kind of works on repositories or models and that kind of thing, and you're gathering a collection of things, you have the kind of assurance that you're always getting an array back. You're not potentially getting strings or null or whatever. Yes, Billy? Does this? Um, is this also covered by that, that previous strict typing? So will it cast if I return a yes. one? Yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure about the runtime of when it's cast, huh? but um, as far as I'm aware it is, I can have a dig around as well and clarify just to make sure. But um, as far as I can see, yeah. Um, the only downside to this, which a lot of other languages have, which slightly would have been good, um, is you can't do void as a return type. So you can't say that it doesn't return anything, um, which would be nice, but you know, maybe next time. Um, for, for now, it's a, it's a step forward. It's just kind of gives you a little bit Sorry, more security. Yeah, so if you don't return anything, it's like an implicit void, right? Well, yeah, if you don't return anything, it's implicit, but you can't, you can't make it through an error if you return something yeah, in yeah. a statement that's void. Like, using that, I mean, if you put it as a, a void, method or something in a class, then it would be okay. But yeah, in that situation, you can't actually throw an error for it. It would, it would just do it anyway, even though you shouldn't. Um, so yeah, you kind of avoid that one. Um, the next one is slightly different, moving off again, um, is multiple import declarations. At first, this seems a little bit weird, but it's it's quite just it's basic syntax, um, syntax sugar that makes things a little bit easier to read, um, makes things easier to follow your code. Previously, if you were working using an autoloader um, and you were calling in a few classes, so you've got use vendor class A, then use vendor class B, and obviously that's not a big deal, <coughs> but if you're using a big framework and you've got this horrific monster controller that has 60 classes that it's using, obviously don't do that. But if, it, if you are doing that, you've got a massive block of use X, Y, Z, all the way down, 60 symphony components and you know whatever else. Um, so in BHP 7, there is a nice way of doing that where you can use curly brackets. So you can say use vendor curly brackets and say class A comma class B, and it just inherits the namespace. So it's exactly the same thing, but it means that you've got, when you look at it, it's much more readable. You don't have this huge dot block at the top of your class. It's, you know, it just makes it a little bit easier to scan. i say it doesn't actually change the way anything works. So that's, yeah, not, not too much of a problem. Um, another one of the goodies is anonymous classes, uh, which are, are cool. Um, there's lots of reasons they're cool. I'll give you a, an example of how to make an anonymous class. If people use like other languages, it's probably a fairly familiar idea. Um, where these are throwaway classes, and um, so you can assign a class to a variable, um, and you can give it some functions, and that variable can then be called, and you can call that function on the class, but it only exists as long as that variable exists. Once that variable is gone, it's gone, and um, it's it's no longer used. Um, that doesn't seem like a great thing at first when you first think about it, but um, it means that you can make a class without needing to go through any auto-loading. You don't need to go through including files or including, like you can just make something there and then when you need it, throw it away afterwards, you don't care. Which is particularly good when you're doing testing and you want to mock something out. You don't necessarily want to have 70 files of, if it's a fairly simple thing, you don't necessarily want to have auto-loading to include all these files just for mock stuff. Whereas you can just mock them out and throw them into whatever function they need to be going into and it saves a little bit of time there. So that's going to be Pretty cool. That's one of the things I quite, quite like about it as well. So, as a as a brief overview of the new and the shiny, uh, we've got a combined comparison operator, an uncle less type hints, type 
pence, tight pence, tight pence, all the good tight pence, wonderful. Uh, multiple import declarations, anonymous classes, and then there's two ones that I didn't have time to write slides for. So, um, like, yeah, cool. I'll talk about that in a minute. So we've got um, capture method on method calls on non-objects. Like, I mean, if you've used most CMSs particularly, you to throw this one up every now and then. Um, not mentioning any names, but WordPress. Um, if if you call a method on an array, it just freaks out if they breaks. You can now catch that error, and you can gracefully try and salvage the situation a little bit. Um, obviously, if you want to learn more about that and there's kind of intricacies and details of it, there's plenty of resources online that will help you out with that. <coughs> and the last one is random mint and random byte. These are pseudo random, cryptographically secure random number, pseudo random number generators. So apparently they're more secure. To be honest, the cryptography side of it is way over my head. Like it gets, it's beyond what I, I can get my head around. But apparently it's better for from a security point of view. So there you go. It's still not random because obviously it's a computer, it can't do random, but it can do close to random. So that's that's wonderful. There are also, some stuff that have been removed and some things that have been changed. So we've got, so, to be honest, some of these I have no idea who the hell was doing this. Like some of the, I don't understand what was going on when, like, yeah. <laughs> um, so multiple default cases in a switch statement. Uh, why? <laughs> like why? Would you, what, what possible reason would you have to say? But now it throws an error, which is sensible. That's logical. Stop people doing things. And um, take it out the crazy PHP tags. There's a more crazy one, which was too long to fit on the slides, which is the kind of script language equals PHP, blah, 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 all that. Like, I've never seen that in anyone's code ever. So they're gone, good stuff. And um, this is also going into the kind of the errors and exception handling stuff, where e strict has been taken away. Um, and it's now replaced with either e deprecated e notice or e warning, depending on the context that it's in. Um, again, there's a link at the end which goes into that in a little bit more detail. Um, the next one's probably one of the ones that will might actually catch people out a little bit um, if they're really really mean. Is re um, reserve types so you can't make a class. I didn't know you could do this, but apparently in PHP five you can make a class called int. Um, and just mess with other developers, like. Um, but now you can't make a class, an interface, or a trait using any of these reserve type names. Because, but if anyone was making a class called null, then they are less evil. Like, that's just there's no that's excuse for that. It's just false. not cool. Yeah, exactly. It's just like no, don't do that. Um, so yeah, they they are now no longer allowed. They're not keywords, proper keywords, but they are reserve types. You can't use them as class names. Um, Integer semantics, again, this is a very technical one. Um, the basics of it, it's a, um, not number one. Um, if you cast that to an int, it used to return this ridiculous massive number, um, a negative number, I think it was. Um, it was just a bit crazy. Now it returns zero. Um, there's also some kind of bitwise stuff that's into that if you're moving around bits and you need to have kind of accuracy on that. If that's something you do, read into it because it's probably important. I think on the most people it's not a use case that comes up that often so I've decided that I'd give my brain a rest and not that's the, that's into the sort it. of thing where you, you see speak some people say no the right JavaScript things are not numbers. What yeah. they call number. Yeah. Thanks JavaScript. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks PHP. Yeah exactly. Not, so, a number, zero yeah. In there. not only if you cast it to an in that's yeah. fine. Um they've also taken out lots of extensions that are dead have not been used for ages or deprecated or uh, unsupported for decades or whatever. So they've got rid of a lot of the extensions that just kind of bulk out the, the ecosystem a little bit. Um, this one, again, the next one is um, hex support and numeric strings. Again, something I didn't know you could do previously. You could write a hex number as string and then cast it to an int and it would actually give you the, the value as an integer of that hex string. Yep. Not something I ever had to do, but in PHP 7 you can't. It, it's zero. It's that's it. It's gone. Does yes. that affect as numeric? I, I haven't looked into that, but we can. Would, would go through it before. But if you can't really? catch an end, that's making sense that they're maybe a lot. Potentially not. Um, I don't know. I didn't think about that, to be honest. So yeah. we can have a Google later. Yeah. If we work it out, it'll be good. Um, and the last one is PHP 4 style constructors. Um, if people were doing PHP 4 at all, when you've got a class, um, 
if you had, this is a terrible example, I could have chose any other word, but fine. Um, yeah, so she got a class, um, and the first function in that class was the name of the class, in oh, lowercase, yeah, okay. it used that function as the constructor. Mm -hmm. If you put a constructor after that, it still used that function as a constructor. If you put a constructor before that, it used the constructor. So it was a bit mental. They've just gone, no, it. constructor or nothing. I, I just feel, as I said, a bad word. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so they've, they've taken that one out. Um, that, I guess, if you're using particular legacy code bases, yeah. that might crop in. Um, so there's kind of the, the, what PHP 7 is and what it's not. And um, the next step is obviously why you should care. Because from a, from a kind of standpoint, most of these functions, if it's not something that you inherently see use in, which a lot of them, uh, until you reach a problem where it solves it, you might not see how useful they are. Um, so we yeah, have... Well, first of all, it's why seven and not six. Um, and I, I thought of it this, and I thought, what's the most clear and concise way that I can explain it? And then wrote something completely different. So um, PHP 6 was a thing, but then it wasn't a thing. So they thought having another thing might cause some confusion. Um, basically, PHP 6 was going to be released as PHP 6. And some people, in the wonderful way that internet is, were so eager. They wrote books about it and blog posts about it. And then it never happened. So they thought, if we release PHP 6 now, it's going to cause confusion with books and blog posts that already exist for something that is so different from what PHP 6 would have been. So they went, you know what, just drop it, go with 7, it's fine. It's not quite as mental as Windows, so we're, we're all good. <laughs> like, um, yeah, now, that isn't obviously the, the main why. Um, the main why is that it's fast. Um, like, so fast it skipped the version. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, exactly, that's it. It left PHP 6 behind in its speed. Um, so yeah, the main benefit of using PHP 7 is it's fast. And not fast in the way that if you write code for PHP 7, it's fast. In the way that if you take code that runs on PHP 5, put it on PHP 7, it's fast. Like, it's, it's not that you have to do a lot of work to make it fast, it's just faster. The engine has been completely rewritten, um, and it does make everything kind of, you get a huge performance boost across the board. Um, this is wonderful benchmarks. Um, benchmarks on the whole can be slightly pointless, but I thought I would include some slides because otherwise, how do you prevent anything fast without some kind of reference? Um, so this is the built-in Zen bench, I think it's called, and um, it comes with PHP, um, and just runs through the benchmarking process and does the times. So you've got 5.3, 5.4, 5.5, 5.6, so seven. Um, and as you can see, it's quite clear how much faster PHP 7 is, even from 5.6, which is still the kind of, today is the, the current supported standard version. Um, so the jump down is quite significant. Obviously, that's using a benchmark that comes bundled with PHP, so it's not a wonderfully accurate representation of real world From use. The of PHP. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so there's more details on the benchmarking there and some kind of caveats and details about how the benchmarking process works um, on Lorna James' website, um, who I did not steal much content from. <laughs> no, I'm lying, but to give me. The next one is a real world example, um, the wonderful WordPress 4.11. Um, yeah. um, so it's WordPress, it's basically, this is 20 concurrent um, connections to a WordPress site, all going to the homepage of WordPress, and this is how many requests a second the server can handle. Um, here you can see obviously 5.6 has got 270. As soon as you upgrade to PHP 7, which WordPress runs on fine, by the way, except from potentially third party plugins might cause some problems. But um, WordPress core runs on it fine. Um, you do that and it doubles the amount of requests a second you can handle, which puts us in the realms of HHVM. So that's obviously always been kind of HHVM looks down its nose. It, PHP because it's slow and clumsy, but we're getting there in terms of kind of competing with it. Um, I've also got an example of Drupal 8, which this one suggests that it's faster than HHVM. I'm not entirely convinced about how that benchmark's been worked out, but that's by the by. It's just to prove that across the board, everything PHP 7 is faster than the other versions of PHP 6. I would be inclined to say just ignore the HHVM comparison because it's probably a little bit more um, skewed than it could otherwise be. So that's that's why you should upgrade. Um, the next bit, obviously, is how do you upgrade? Um, it's not the easiest thing at the moment because it's not fully released. So you need to kind of look around and try and work out the best way for you to do it. At the moment, you shouldn't really be deploying it to production. So 
don't upgrade on like production servers, that's a terrible idea. Um, wait a couple of weeks and then it'll be fine. Um, so for now, it would be best to just throw up a VM virtual machine with PHP 7 on it and test your application. Just move your code base over, test your applications on the new PHP 7 server that you've got, make sure they work, and then you can go through the kind of upgrade process, depending on what server you're on, if you're on, you know, Ubuntu, whatever it'll be like app get update, or if you're on CentOS, you'll have to jump through hoops and try and work out exactly what's going on. Or if you're on Windows, you just cry. And <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a, a, a you know various different depending on your server situation. And um, again, wonderful Laura Jane, who has got lots of information on her website about PHP seven, which is useful, and um, has said that this is the easiest upgrade yet. And um, that's from the point of coming from five point five or five point six. Um, if anyone has ever done the 5.3 to 5.4 upgrade, that can be a nightmare. So um, comparatively, yeah, it's really, really straightforward. Um, it's, it's a really kind of, it's a good step forward in making these things a little bit more um, streamlined. There are, however, some kind of caveats on, on that process being easy. Um, they will be, if you've got a smaller code base, then yeah, the upgrade is probably going to be fine because less things to go wrong, less code, less problems. Um, that's generally the case anyway. Um, the next one is might be so surprising is that older code bases are more likely to be fine as well. Um, that's because the majority of the changes are enhancements rather than removing things. So if you've got something that was written in PHP 4, which runs on PHP 5.5 at the moment, everything that is gone was deprecated in 5.5, so we'd be throwing warnings and errors. So the upgrade process is fairly smooth. The only thing to be aware of, obviously, is the constructors. If you're using PHP 4 style constructors, be aware of that and take them out, because to us it's confusing anyway. Um, but yeah, so the majority of simple PHP 4 style applications should work without any major refactoring in PHP 7. Um, on the flip side, any modern applications that you've built using kind of component-based frameworks that run on 5.5 and 5.6, you're also quite likely to be able to upgrade it without too many problems. Same being that it's adding features, it's not taking things away. So if you're running on something that was built for 5.556, you should be okay. There might be some niggles, don't, you know, don't hunt me down if things go wrong. But on the whole, um, it should be all right. The final one, which is the easiest way to make sure it is, is if you've got a good test coverage on your current application, when you move it up to PHP 7, straight away you will know whether things have gone wrong. So it's going to be, yeah. You know, if you've got you know, unit test, integration test, all the stuff like that, and um, all the good things in there, then you have that kind of stopgap where you find out that things are broken before you actually get to, to production server. Um, if you don't have that and you're working on a legacy system that doesn't have testing, obviously pull down the, the virtual machine and just test it manually. Um, so that's the next bit is, yeah. The, the only way to be 100% sure that the apps or sites that you've built will work on PHP 7 is to test it. Um, Rasmus has got the PHP 7 virtual machine. It's a Vagrant box. You just clone the Git, um, Git repository, run Vagrant up. It's good to go. Like, I mean, it's that simple. It's really easy. Um, the only thing is, a little caveat I noticed that when I was doing it is you need to, he comments out the shared folders. So if you're, you don't actually have a, a web folder, so you need to add that in before you build it. Um, build it for the first time. But other than that, it's fairly straightforward to get it up and running pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, you can go on GitHub, there's detailed instructions if you're wanting to do it the kind of the easy way or if you're wanting to make your own build of PHP 7 or if you want to pull down the latest version of PHP 7 after a new release candidate has been pulled up. Um, so yeah, it's yeah, it's there, it's available, it's supported and it's a really good way of testing your applications. Um, whether that's with actual tests or whether that's just loading them up in a browser, does it work? yes or no, like whatever you are able to do, um, that's, that's a really good way of getting around it. The last bit um, is when, um, the answer to that is now kind of and very soon. Um, so PHP 7 release candidate 6 was released on the 29th, which was last week. So 29th of October, that is the release candidate 6, which obviously release candidates previously have, have gone out. Um, and this is the kind of the most up-to-date version of PHP 7 that's available. Um, not for particularly long though, because in eight days, PHP 7 general um, general availability 
is launched, which is PHP 7 is live. PHP 7 is the thing now that is what it's going at. So that's only yet yeah, eight days until PHP 7 is real and you can use it and you can put it on production servers and it's cool. Um, then obviously there does come the slight difficulty of who can you use PHP 7 with? Um, if you're using shared hosting, sorry, um, basically, like, um, shared hosting notoriously up and down on whether they support PHP upgrades and whether they don't. Um, some of them are still running 5.3, some of them I'm sure are probably running older than that. But um, yeah, it's just finding, finding a hosting thread that you can actually run PHP 7 on might be a bit challenging at first, um, but there is some promising starts. Um, Phil Sturgeon put together a website called phpversion.info, which is uh, it's basically it's based off a of GitHub repo. You can send in pull requests, and it's all hosting providers and what version of PHP they support. Um, and there's already a tag for it for PHP 7, which has, I think, about six um, hosting providers that support the release candidates for PHP 7 already which is very promising considering when it comes out next week, if they're supporting release candidates, they're bound to upgrade to actually supporting the full version of PHP. So that, yeah, it's promising. It's a good place to kind of keep an eye on. If you're on a hosting provider and you notice that it's not listed, just set up a pull request. Just do it because then there's going to be other people who are in a similar position who you can help, you can give that information out to. And um, it's going to be updated because obviously it's done through GitHub. They were talking about making it automated, but yeah. At the moment, just push up pull requests and everyone loves you, um, so that's good. That's actually the, the end of the, the kind of the formalized version of the talk. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Anyone who's watching, give us money, that'd be cool. Um, like, follow us on Twitter as well, and um, that's always always welcome. Um, we do try and talk some sense occasionally on there. Um, and then I'm just going to leave that up. Um, oh, I'm going to leave that up. Uh, which is just a couple of references um, for where I stole most of this material from. So um, there's Cal Evans who has done a blog for Zend on PHP 7. It's just a kind of brief overview of PHP 7. Um, Erica Heidi who has done a much better talk than I did on YouTube. Um, it's available to watch if you want. Um, Lorna Jane, just pretty much everything she's done is, is good. Like just go on a website, have a browse around. There's loads of resources, loads of blog posts, slide decks and stuff like that. It, um, yeah, so she's got a lot of information on there that's really good. Phil Sturgeon did a PHP 7 feature freeze, which is an overview of his personal opinions of each new feature that was added to PHP, which is good. It's a, it's a really honest um, honest overview of the features, how useful they are and how less useful some of them are. Um, so yeah, that's really good. Um, and particularly if you're looking at the kind of exceptions and error handling stuff, um, Davy Shafik, which I linked to earlier, is a really good article on that, which kind of covers all the bases um, and gives you a very good overview of everything. 